Before we can determine whether or not our boat will float, we need to determine how much the boat weighs. So in this tutorial video, we're going to be looking at the weight and center of gravity of the example boat, which is shown here on the title slide. Let's take a look at the weight tab of the calculation spreadsheet. First, we'll list all the steel pieces that make up the hull. Then we'll list the components that also contribute to weight, like the rudder, the steering assembly, the propulsion motor, and the battery. If a sandbag is incorporated in the design, then we'll add that as well. The sandbag may or may not be needed as ballast. Unfortunately, at this point in the design, it may be difficult to assess whether or not the sandbag is needed in order to correct a trim condition. This will be a condition that I may need to revisit once I determine my trim. I also need to list my payload as weights. In this example, my boat is carrying four cinder blocks, so I have each listed as a separate item. The way the payloads are listed is dependent on the guidelines. If I was carrying golf balls, I could go above and beyond and list each golf ball as an item, or I could group them if the guidelines allows. Next, I'm going to list the part number for each line item on the spreadsheet. This is not simply numbering them in numerical order. The part number correlates to the drawings, which should be finished by this point, so that I can quickly reference between the two documents. Next I'll list the side of the hull the parts are on. If I list a part as lying on the center line, I should expect that my TCG for that part is already zero. Since component and payload weights are supplied by the guidelines, there is no need to list their dimensions, areas, or weight density. Now I'm going to list the dimensions of the parts. If a part is square or rectangular, the dimensions are the length and width. Of course, there are many parts of a boat's hull that are not square or rectangular in nature, so for those parts, just list the two maximum dimensions that bound it. These dimensions serve to give the part area calculations justification. Since the rudder is designed by the team, these dimensions also need to be listed. This also ensures the team did not forget to dimension the rudder on the drawing set. Next, list the part shape. This not only brushes up on your geometry, but makes it easier for the judges to switch between the spreadsheet and the drawings. I've listed some of my shapes as modified. For example, my starboard and port hull plates, if we go back to the example, because they're modified by this little fillet right here. Also, I've listed my forward and aft bulkheads as modified rectangles because I've taken holes out of them so that they're not as heavy as rectangle steel plates. And then my last piece that's modified is my steering box mount top plate. And that's because it has three holes drilled in it so the steering box can be mounted to it. Next I will list my service areas. Of course, this is not the service area of the entire plate, you know, all six sides. This is only one surface area of the part because of the units of the weight density being in pounds per square inches. If I have a rectangle or a square, I expect the area to equal the product of the two dimensions. Otherwise, I can find the areas from CAD or by hand. If the areas are done by hand, it'd be wise to include them in the final submittal. Now I'll list my weight density as given by the guidelines. Some conversion may be necessary here because the requested units are in pounds per square inch. For this example, I was given 5.1 pounds per square foot. To convert this, I divide by 144 square inches. The weight density is dependent on the steel type that we order, so it might not be the same every year. To get individual weight, I'll multiply the area by the weight density. For components, these weights are listed in the guidelines. Notice that my cinder blocks are unusually light at 8.27 pounds. This was intentional for this example so that my calculations work out later on. Please do not modify weights arbitrarily. When I sum the weight column, I get the total weight of my boat in the water at 366.43 pounds. This is how much water my boat will displace in order to float. Next, I will locate each part in relation to the boat's reference point. Each part has a vertical, longitudinal, and transverse distance from the reference point. 
These values are most easily calculated from CAD, which is explained in the CAD videos. If any of these distances are calculated by hand, it'd be helpful to include them in the submittal. Note that parts farther aft have larger longitudinal distances from the reference point and that parts on the port side have negative transverse distances. Next I multiply my weight by my distances to get my moments. To get my vertical moment, I multiply my weight by my vertical center of gravity distance to get my vertical moment. To get my longitudinal moment, I multiply my weight by my longitudinal center of gravity distance to get my longitudinal moment. Finally, to get my transverse moment, I multiply my weight by my transverse center of gravity distance to get my transverse moment. The heavier the part and the farther away from the reference point, the greater the moment. Now I sum my moment columns. To get the boat's composite center of gravity, I divide each moment sum by the boat's weight. For instance, to get the boat's vertical center of gravity, I divide the sum of the vertical moments by the boat's weight. So each of these parts are contributing a vertical moment of these numbers to the boat. And so I take their sum and divide it by the boat's entire weight to find that the entire boat has a single vertical center of gravity distance of 6.06 .06 inches above the baseline. It's important that before I continue on with my calculations, I ensure that I have no transverse moment. And the reason I want no transverse moment is because I want no transverse center of gravity. If I have a transverse center of gravity, then I know my boat is listing in the water. For instance, if a person can stand upright, like so, but then they carry a pail of water in one hand, you'd expect that to correct this condition. They would try to lean to one side. It's kind of inevitable. So what happened is their center of gravity, which used to be in their chest, now shifted transversely a little bit outwards, and therefore they rotate that way. The reason we want no list in the boat design competition is because all of your calculations are going to assume that the boat is perfectly upright. If in fact the boat is not upright, then the rest of the calculations will not accurately describe the boat's conditions when it hits the water. For example, in the next section we're going to calculate the station area in order to find the boat's displacement. So we're going to calculate the station area underneath the water line, which will be this area right here. But if your boat is listing, then the station area that is actually happening in the water is right here. And of course these two station areas uh, are not the same, and therefore what we are calculating is not what your boat's actually experiencing. So we need to make sure that we have no list so that we have this condition here and we're actually calculating the right values.